This is 16 to 1, a podcast about education, teaching, and learning. I'm good. I, I mean, I'm as good as any teacher in February, but I'm good. You're sick, right? I am. So we might get some sniffle snorkels. There's going to be a lot of sniffling. Yeah. It's just, I was just telling Chelsea that October through like March, you're like one cough away from a constant ear infection. Ohio has been pretty mild as far as winter goes. So now I'm like, are these allergies or am I sick? We have had snow days though. Three, which is nothing. It's kind of exciting though. It's better than zero. I've never had this few. All right. So I am Chelsea. I'm Katie. And we're back with another episode of 16 to 1. We will have a quick couple of housekeeping notes here. First is that we switched podcast hosts. We don't have a whole lot of episodes out yet. So we figured now was the best time to do it. We weren't super happy with our last one. And I found this on the recommendation of a fellow podcaster, this new service. So if there are any technical hiccups or if your podcast feed for us looks a little bit different, um, that's why if there are any issues, get in touch with us and we'll do some troubleshooting. We have a couple of corrections. <laughs> Can we, I start with mine? Yeah. Cause I'm an idiot. Sure. We, we've been hearing from our listeners about <laughs> a couple of fun corrections. This one is actually okay. a self correction. I, right? I don't know how it came to me. It just came to me in the car, but we were driving and all of a sudden it occurred to me that the last episode, the music one, I talked about the didgeridoo. I offhandedly mentioned that I hadn't really thought about the mix-up for at soccer games, and a didgeridoo and a vuvuzela are two different things. So it's called a vuvuzela, the thing that you're thinking about at yeah. soccer games. and that's what I was thinking of. And what is a vuvuzela exactly? It's just a big plastic horn, so probably, but that's what you see at soccer games. Right. Now, You also, probably confused the two because they're both really long and obnoxious. They are of a similar, yeah... But the didgeridoo is like the aboriginal people right. of Northern Australia. That's their instrument. Right. And they're similar in that they're both a long <laughs> horn. They're both long. thing. That's about it. Anyway, the long... they're not the same thing. They're different. And I'm sorry. That's okay. I'll do better. Uh, my correction came from somebody who knows a lot about old stuff. Um, <laughs> my friend, my friend Angel... Uh, listen to the show, uh, our episode about dress codes. And I'm not exactly sure where in that episode, but I'm sure it was in that episode. I said something about either the classical or medieval period, and I got the years on them very wrong. Um, I I had an education in this stuff, but I never... We didn't... We were, we were studying it for the content, and we never particularly did a, <laughs> a great job of putting it all together like on a timeline. Sure which is a sort of normal way of thinking of this stuff, but just not the way we thought of this stuff. So I've been chronically bad about knowing when periods of history are, when they start and stop, and things like that. So the correction is... <laughs> I mean, basically, when we say things, though, we're just like, of this era. We're not actually looking for, like, the year. But you must have yeah, said I got a, the I century. Got the era. I think I got okay. the era wrong. I don't know what exactly No, that's I fine. I was just trying to... But, but to clear it all up, 400 is when the classical era ends, 400 AD. Classical era ends there, and medieval starts, and then goes through to the Renaissance, which covers the 15th and 16th centuries. So there we are. And now we're here. Yeah. Welcome to 2020. <laughs> Welcome to 2020. <laughs> Whatever period We this definitely is. didn't miss anything in history, between those. <laughs> history is going to maybe look back on this current era as a dark one. Anyway, the second Dark Ages. And with that, I think we can move on to what we're talking about this week, which is... Cell phones. Cell phone use. And if they do and do not, or how, I guess, they do belong, if they do, in the classroom. What was that? Didgeridoo. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're going to talk about cell phones and how and if they belong in the classroom. Right, right. And sort of the complications of them, I guess. Yeah, like, it's becoming a more and more hotly debated topic in yeah. education circles because... Digital technology in the classroom is a bit of a sticky wicket. It's a difficult... Why are you laughing? That's <laughs> a sticky wicket. 
it's it's a hard thing to manage for a whole lot of reasons. <laughs> Thank you for and we're going to talk breaking about, down the sticky wicket part of it. We're going to talk about those reasons. Okay, well, I think your home is in the in the history of cell phones. I we're not. This is. I just found. I found some. I found some really fun facts when they are researching fun. this because I just didn't know about some of these things, and I thought it would be fun to share with people. But so wireless telephony is older, way older than I thought. <laughs> Telephony. Uh, telephony. I think it's telephony. I know it is. Uh, well, I might be wrong, but that's how I... No, I'm joking. <laughs> telephony. So the history that I found starts as far back as 1918 or a few years before that. Actually, I found somebody a few years before that, but they got sued for claiming that they had made a wireless telephone when they really hadn't made a wireless telephone. But in 1918, the German railroad system tested wireless telephony on military trains. In 1924, public trials started with telephone connections on trains between Berlin and Hamburg. Why are you doing that? <laughs> Hamburg. <laughs> Just she's giving the me, show. She's giving me a look, listeners. There are a lot of fiction writers and artists anticipating the development of real-world mobile phones. Star um, Trek? Yeah, sort of. I mean, that is actually... Usually that's where yes. you go next. I wasn't going to talk about Star Trek, but it does happen in Star Trek, the communicators, yeah. But so this is in 1906. <laughs> There's an English caricaturist, Louis Bomber, published a cartoon in Punch magazine entitled Forecast for 1907. This is from Wikipedia, in which he showed a man and a woman in London's Hyde Park, one of, one of them's gambling and one of them's dating on wireless telephony equipment, which is... Like kinda, together? No, they're separately? both in the, they're both in the park and they are separately doing these things on their wireless devices, which is exactly what is happening. Now you could probably walk to any park and see somebody gambling and somebody dating on their cell phone. So and then like in nineteen Tinder. Tinder, right. In nineteen twenty six, an artist, Carl Arnold, created a visionary cartoon about the use of mobile phones in the street. In the picture of wireless telephony published in the German satirical magazine Simplicity. Oh my god. In this German magazine. <laughs> Try again. Not going to do it. Simplic <laughs> Spell it. Simplicissimus. <laughs> anyway, we'll throw a link to that image in the show notes because it's kind of funny. But so we're going to skip ahead a whole lot because before 1973, the phones are linked to some other big machine. So train phones mm -hmm. and we get auto like car phones and they're huge and they're wireless in a way, but they're still chained to you know, a bigger, they're still chained to a bigger vehicle of some sort. In 1973, Motorola becomes the first company to produce a handheld mobile phone. And it's handheld in a loose sense of that word, because it kind of takes two hands to hold it. It's so big. But <laughs> but technically, they're right. But technically, they are right. Also, the first flip phone, cell phone that I owned was a Motorola phone. So that's kind of fun. On April 3rd, 1973, this guy named Martin Cooper, who is a Motorola researcher, made the first mobile phone call from a handheld, and he placed the call to Dr. Joel Engel of Bell Labs, I who love was that. a rival. What a power move. Right? So Bell Labs... Like, look what I did. Uh-huh. Bell Labs, big name in telephones. Motorola researcher got to kind of stick it to him and say, hey, fast forward to now, just over half of children in the United States now own a smartphone by the age of 11. Yeah. Which sounds crazy to me, but... Yeah. Probably isn't, no. given the current reality. 84% <laughs> no. of teenagers have their own phones, and one in five children has a phone by age eight. That blows my mind. No. That seems so young. Oof. I just... Ugh, man. It seems really young, but I, you know. Well, anyway, let's move on. So cell phones are ubiquitous now, so much so that states are starting to take explicit stances on legislation about them. California recently passed legislation that allows school districts to restrict or prohibit device use in class, although it's not a requirement, which I kind of find interesting. If it's not a requirement, why do we need to pass legislation about it? Well, it's California. Things are that, weird out what there. What does that just give the school grounds? Yeah, I'm wondering if it is something like that, because we kind of talked about this in the dress code episode about restricting freedom of expression yeah. and speech and communication and things sure. like that. So I'm wondering if there are explicit protections that they had to legislate about mm -hmm. with cell phone use. But anyway, mm -hmm. California passed this stuff. At least four other states are considering it. This is from 2019, so yeah. it's pretty recent. Other countries have had more success enacting widespread bans, bans, successes relative there. It's whatever you're trying to accomplish may or may not work. I mean... But. 
Um, it's kind of hard to define that success, isn't it? Yeah. Ontario in Canada is restricting This is what phone. I read about as well. Yeah. It's restricting cell phone, student cell phone mm-hmm. use during instructional time. Mm-hmm. There's an exception for classroom activities in that one and health and other emergencies. Which I think is fair. Right. Reasonable. And in 2018, France passed a law outlawing the use of cell phones in schools for students up to age 15. That's true. My French student has talked about that. So it's, they're just completely banned until they're 15? Is that the deal? Uh, I think she said that it could be in their backpack, but if it's seen, it's like gone. Like, goodbye forever. Interesting. Yeah. Well, the the Ontario one, that was one that I found as well. I'm trying to remember what the link was. It was like OxfordLearning.com mm-hmm. talked about the school a little bit, mm-hmm. and they said that this is quoted from this article, but it said that students check their phones in the classroom an average of more than 11 times a day. And so obviously all of that adds up really, really quickly. But I think that's probably low. Unless it's like a test day. I think maybe they get caught checking them 11 times a day. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure where that number comes from or how they would monitor that. But yeah, that then. feels like not enough. But I, th- I mean, I think that their attempt in that is trying to say that it's excessive. Mm-hmm. And that it's obviously taking away right. from class time. So students who do have phones, yes. you know, they'll spend up to 20% mm-hmm. of their in-class time texting, emailing, checking social media. I mean, probably not emailing so much. This, yeah. the, the verbiage on There's some no- of these studies <laughs> seems a little disconnected from yeah. the current youth, as it were. <laughs> but yeah, so so there's a lot of opportunity for distraction but I think there's a lot of learning opportunity this, too. So this let's... is a topic I really, I'm really torn on. Uh huh. Me too. I I can probably go a couple ways. If I wasn't a teacher, I would feel very, very different. But as a teacher, I I know exactly where I stand. What do you feel about it at the moment? I'm afraid as a teacher. So my kids. What I mean by afraid is like you'll see in the news like, oh kids take video of something happening in the classroom they take a photo of a teacher and things get out of control and whatever so i'm pretty cautious so my kids put their phones up in a holder so you don't want to be captured doing something uh, no because i'm like i'm sarcastic i mean i don't know how clear it is in a podcast but i'm very sarcastic Mm -hmm. and my students know that but Mm -hmm. i'm also like i want to enjoy my time so i'll like whatever i'm kind of dramatic i suppose dramatic so i don't know if that would be like great to have captured for someone to be like look at what you know katie did today or whatever the case you, know you just I mean? want to be free to teach in the most organic yes. way that you can without fear of being caught and forever. i don't want to have to like i mean not that i have a problem explaining or rationalizing what i'm doing but like it can just be misconstrued so many ways that it's difficult yes so that's my fear but I also, I have a hard time because I love technology. Like, I do yearbook, and I used to do the school newspaper, and we do, you know what I mean? Like, as someone who uses a lot of technology in the classroom, I love it, and I'm trying to use it as much as I can, but it's a really hard thing to balance as a teacher because cell phones open up a lot bigger problems than, like, Chromebooks do. Mm-hmm. And so my class, I'm lucky enough in my district that I have a set of Chromebooks just for my class, and so we use them probably four days a week. So I can implement that kind of stuff and do the technology stuff. But to be honest, like there are times that I wish I could just say, okay, get on your phone and go here because it'd be so much quicker, Mm -hmm. but I can't trust them Mm -hmm. because they're sophomores and they're too busy Snapchatting and whatever. Yeah. Let's talk about pros and cons and just sort of spell them out a little bit. So we've got apps that can enhance apps and websites that can enhance the learning experience. And you've Mm -hmm. used some of those. We'll talk about some examples of those educational digital media of all kinds can be consumed on cell yeah. phones you've talked about you know ted talks in the past yeah, there's, there's a lot of ted talks i didn't include that yeah we've got audiobooks mm-hmm. um well it's al- also a great way to access news sources like right right when we're talking about like the post or something like that you know in southeastern ohio we don't have access you know to some of right. these prints news and research yeah so that's a great way right there are a lot of things like that that are special to digital access that you can't really have unless you've yeah. got an internet connected device so mm-hmm. i think there's just so much available on the internet that is so that presents such an opportunity for education that i hesitate to close that off however I too. however we have some cons associated with well this is what i see too. is like this is where i see schools covering their butts the most i guess is what i would say and it's I mean, obviously, there's, like, cheating, there's sexting, there's, like, what I was talking about, like, if 
whatever teachers are doing in the classroom. Um, the students won't take the ownership, obviously, to like admit like, oh, I did this. But bullying, like if cyberbullying wasn't such a prevalent issue for schools, then I think that you would see schools being more relaxed on the cell phone front. But as long as the schools are being held accountable for what the kids are doing during the school day on their phones, Mm -hmm. I think we're going to see a push towards the removal or, you know what I mean? Like, I think that's going to be the way it goes because I know my administration spends so much time a week dealing with kids who are getting cyberbullied or something. You know what I mean? Like, it's it takes up so much time mm-hmm. on the school's end, and that's in a school that doesn't allow cell phones. Right. So imagine what it would be like with a more lax, you know. Yeah, that's a method of bullying that didn't exist when I was in, yeah. in high school. It's completely right? different. Instagram wasn't a thing. Yeah. Uh, Facebook was barely a thing. That way of your life being able to be destroyed yes. by a Snapchat was mm-hmm. just and not that's what it a is. thing. And there are plenty, plenty of other ways for our lives to be destroyed <laughs> I mean, socially trust me. in high school, but cyberbullying was not one of those avenues. Mm. So that's a, a new monster that has kind of risen out of widespread self But cheating ownership. is a real issue as well. Like, I kind of glossed cheating. over it, but mm-hmm. it's a big one. Mm-hmm. Like, it happens all the time. Like, I was reading kids- about students taking pictures of quizzes and sending yeah. it to the people who are going to take the quizzes later in the day. Yep. yep. And that's why I create multiple quiz. Yeah, I mean, but like teachers do those things, but they're still not right. like foolproof. Like- those kinds of things create more work. For and I listed teachers. on here as well, like smart watches. And like I see my kids with them and they do goofy things, even with their watches, even when their phone is hanging up across the room. Even then, like they're not even aware enough of like that. You know what I mean? And like that's what's hard with teenagers is like we're dealing with mm-hmm. people who even without their phones, are right. still making poor decisions with what right. remains. So for teenagers, if there is something subversive to do with a device, <laughs> they, will, the way. they will do it. Yeah. They will do it. Yeah, so that's kind of the landscape of it. But let's let's go back and talk about some of those learning apps and resources yeah. and I mean, websites. There are times that I... And I, I hate to be this way because I love technology and I think it's one of the most exciting parts of education, but... You just can't trust them. Not all of them. But, I mean, I do see kids using some of them for good. Uh, One of their favorite things is Quizlet, which allows them to create quizzes on an app or on the website and take it. So, like, flashcards. That one's really cool. It's really popular. Mm -hmm. Um, What is nice about it is that one person could create it and then share it with a bunch of people. Mm -hmm. So, maybe that's good. Maybe that's bad. But it's really, really popular. Kahoot is one of my favorite things to do with my kids. And if you were ever at like Buffalo Wild Wings when you were younger, where it was like the trivia on the wall, you know what I'm talking about? Like, it's basically like that. Mm -hmm. Kahoot is smart enough to keep track of all their answers and it scores them appropriately and then it gives me a winner. And then I can use that data to say, this is a question that they struggled with. This answer wasn't clear, like that kind of stuff. So it's actually really great feedback for us. Mm -hmm. Remind 101 is another really popular one. And this is one of the safest ones for teachers and schools to use. It's a group texting app that eliminates phone numbers from being included so that it's traceable and so that by signing up with it, you don't actually have to give a cell phone number. You can use like emails and things like that, Mm -hmm. but it is a way to communicate that isn't quite as personal as texting. But like when I was a softball coach, I used Remind 101 all the time to tell them like games canceled, practices in the box, you know, like that kind of stuff. So it's an easy way to navigate groups of people. Discord is one that's just kind of popped up, and so that's interesting. I've, yeah, so I've like, heard of this, but in Chelsea the and I are of... like into Twitch and stuff, so we like watch our streamers, and they have Discords. Yeah, we've but... heard about this in the context of gaming. Yeah, but my kids, some of my students, are in Discords groups, right? Um, and they pay for them, and so it's like a, a membership sort of thing. And then they go in there and they pay someone else to do their darn homework. Oh my goodness. So like that's so a real thing. Not, this is not really a school sanctioned one like some of these other ones that you've talked no, about. No, but, but what, I guess what I'm trying to say is that like basically they could use it for good. These are limitless. <laughs> right. They could use it for good if they wanted to. Yeah. But uh, don't. But like the, I guess the last thing I'll plug is Google Classroom. Like I live and breathe and die on Google Classroom. Mm-hmm. I die on all Google Docs. This is drives, not, this everything. Is not sponsored content. It by the should way. be because I am a Google certified educator oh, level well, yeah. one you got to get your level two done right? okay i just got level one on, on and it. you watched me get through that um it's a very stressful test it was a lot i mean it took some time they're not kidding when they give you that little banner to put on your twitter or whatever but anyways i as an educator i mean google is just where it's at there's nothing easier to use it's safe um it's easy 
And so there are so many good things, right, that can come in an app mm-hmm. form on a cell phone that the kids have in their pockets that they can whatever. And yet they're still paying people on Discord to do their homework. Right, right. <laughs> so those are some, uh, and again, I'm very pro technology too. I make a living at the moment working with technology um, as a developer. So I, if there's an opportunity to do something, with a computer or a cell phone uh, that is cool, I'm probably going to take it. Yeah. Um, so I I am very interested in a lot of these useful classroom applications and websites. But that being said, even with my love of technology, I was lucky enough to participate in learning environments you know, throughout my own educational background that had no digital devices mm-hmm. in them. My college which i've talked about before was pretty weird in the fact that we never brought cell phones i mean we had cell phones but we never took them out in class we never had laptops in classes um and the reason for that was is that the classes were almost entirely discussion based so you can't bring a device and be absorbed in it and really participate in class in the way that was expected there and that was a pretty interesting kind of no device experiment and the reason that I think it worked is because what was happening retained our attention enough that we wouldn't want to be distracted by a cell phone we'd want to put them away because we wouldn't want to miss what was going on so it's not like it's a lecture where you're listening to someone feed you information and you fall asleep Um, it's a very active kind of learning and that was motivation enough to keep us away from being distracted by our devices. There's also an argument to be made for technology that has to do with accessibility. So the American Disabilities Act pretty much secures people's right to technology and accommodations that are needed for all kinds of different issues and disabilities and things like that. So, you know, there are technologies that help with dyslexia. There are technologies Mm -hmm. that help with time management and attention management. Um, There are technologies that make it easier for people to learn and those accommodations are guaranteed by law so it's you can't really put a blanket ban on technology Mm -hmm. even in a place like what i was talking about my college if it's going to help somebody uh with an accommodation like that learn right i i think it's also interesting because the state test has moved to being online and so that's a whole new thing that we have to get used to um, now they do have some really cool technology uh, incorporated in that, and so there's like a highlighting feature. There's like an underlining feature. They can add notes. They can add comments. They can eliminate things. So like it's really nice for test takers. But it was just one more thing to learn technology wise. But like also like ACT, that's something you can take online. And there's a big shift for this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And so I think that schools are having a hard time sort of navigating the the balance of it, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think. It's a really complex problem. And again, I can see, because I am easily distracted by my cell phone, I can see where it's so easy to think of these technologies as bad things, Mm -hmm. you know, opportunities for bullying, opportunities for cheating, um, opportunities to lose interest in whatever's happening in the classroom. Um, But I can also, I can also make the case that digital literacy and internet literacy are hugely important. Mm -hmm. Cell phones are not going anywhere. The internet is not going anywhere. I think the most important thing that we can try to be teaching, I guess students and I mean all kinds of people, is the time and place, right? Like that's something that I've had to learn as I, I mean, everybody has to learn it. Like there's a time and place for everything. I know in what meetings I can be on my phone. I know when, you know, when I shouldn't be on my phone. And I don't think that most of my students yet are, are aware of that. And I guess that's a hard thing to, like, teach. You know what I mean? So, like, we have to give them the opportunity to learn. So in my classroom, them putting it up in the holder is them learning that, like, this isn't the time or place. And it's Mm -hmm. a very, like, physical, literal thing. But can I just tell you how fast our bathroom breaks are now? Like, that's what I'm talking about. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But I think we all have to learn that, right? Like, we all have to learn to be mindful of technology and consumption and use. And so I think that as an almost 30 year old, like even I sometimes struggle with when I shouldn't, shouldn't be on my phone. And like when I've been consumed on Twitter for way too long or when Reddit has taken over my life. Yeah. Self-regulating is very difficult. And I, but it's hard for us. So think about a teen trying to be like, oh, she's talking. Let me put this down. I get that though. I do think 
that despite the fact it's difficult, you're never going to learn to self-regulate if there's simply a ban. Um, oh, I agree. I just... Right. I, I think some of these devices for, you know, putting them up or, you know, putting them away or something, having mm-hmm. them out of sight during class time, right. is it kind of compromise, especially if they're allowed to take them out for educational uses? Yeah. Um and I think, like, like me in my classroom, like, it's kind of a reward sometimes. And I don't, I use that term, like, I don't know, not as in, like, a do this and get an A and you get your phone. But, like, as a, hey, you guys did a really nice job today. You did what was expected of you. And so the last two minutes, here you go. Like, you know what I mean? So it's, like, these little things. But I think that there are ways to incorporate it to be, like, hey, you did exactly what was expected of you. Nice job. Yeah. Here you go. Are the faculty at your school allowed to be on phones? Are we allowed to or are we? Are, are you We're allowed? We're not supposed to be. Right. That seems really problematic to me. I, I'm i on my phone more than I should be. And I can accept that. But it's also a security thing for me. It's a safety thing for me. I also have an Apple Watch so I can see in real time what's going on. You know, mm-hmm. like I, and this is just me personally, I'm an only child. So like when mom or dad texts and it seems like a weird time, I'm going to look. Because like, you know what I mean? Like, It seems really inappropriate to expect normal functioning adults not to have access to their cell phone during a working day. Well, and why can't we just model to them what it looks like? That's what I wish we could do. Yeah. Rather than playing a game of gotcha and yelling at pretty much everyone Mm -hmm. let's model correct behaviors for digital devices and like i have this beautiful podium that a former student built for me and so i like live at it like my stool is there everything is there it's it's away from my computer it's not near my laptop so like if i'm sitting there and the kids ask me something it is so easy for me to get out my phone and just like really quickly bring it up or look at it or whatever the case like it's so much easier for me to do that than leave my podium, go around my desk, go get on my computer, and I get to sh- you know what I mean? Like, so I I feel like I can find the time and place for it, so they can too. But like, as far as like my media students, like my yearbook kids, they're allowed on their phones. Mm-hmm. How can I teach media? How can we create a yearbook if we're not using social media? If we're not using all right. that stuff? I mean, that goes so there back is a to time the... and place, obviously. Right. That but... goes back to the digital literacy thing I was talking about. For sure. You you teach one of the classes you teach happens on a computer it happens Mm -hmm. online you know Mm -hmm. it's a little bit different because it's not cell phone directly but we have to teach digital literacy because that's what yeah the present and the future both are it's it's a digital world um it's a kind of social currency that we need to be educating our kids about because that's how you kind of advance through the world right now and i want to say like one more thing really quickly if you don't care about like my pro you know, using your phones at times and whatever, because our internet at school is junk with a capital J. It's <laughs> firewall. I don't know what it is. Whatever the security stuff that's going on on this thing has blocked things like the History Channel. No, I'm not saying that the History Channel is the most relevant or up to date source of information, but I've like tried to show a couple different videos or whatever YouTube clips. The kids can't access it from their yeah, Chromebooks reliably. Been... Kids know how to get around these things, mm-hmm. right? So, like, what the school's already trying to safeguard them from is, like, YouTube. It's whatever else. And the kids are finding ways to install things on browsers on school-owned Chromebooks to get around it. Right. So, like, whatever the, like, temptation is has already been completely... You and I mean, like, kids are smart enough to figure it out. Like, our kids are brewing it with technology. They've only grown up with it. Like, these teenagers right now are some of the most competent people because their entire lives have been rooted in technology. I didn't have internet in the house until I was in like middle school. Mm-hmm. I don't want to like get on their, that like soapbox, but no, why I, are we not using this for good? Right. Like, I was pretty disappointed when you told me about this. Um, there's a learning learn to code website called Free Code Camp yeah. <laughs> that, that you and I were looking at some exercises on and you try to bring it up in school and it's blacklisted. I couldn't even do it. Why? Why? I can, yeah. it's, it's a completely free learning resource that is totally geared toward helping students. And it's not even full of ads that no, were there's like... there's nothing bad on yeah. this site. It's a nonprofit. Mm. It's really great. There's nothing dangerous in it. It's it's 
a coding curriculum and there's you know there's a technology teacher yeah. at your school and they probably can't get access to this yeah. resource that is just designed to help people learn it makes me absolutely but all that makes us teachers nutty. do is find ways to get around it too because we want to use you know new technology in our classrooms yeah like there are times when i click on a link to send them my kids for a ted talk and they can't open a ted talk and yeah. like ted talks are literally built for education that kind of stuff makes me absolutely crazy because it's a school district saying, no, you can't learn. Right. I mean, honestly, how dare they? Right. How dare they restrict free-flowing information that can do nothing except expand mm-hmm. a student's mind? It's frustrating. Because yeah. I feel like it's all out there. Like, that's what's hard. You know, that's like, my, I'm someone who's That's my like, soapbox. No, step on it. But I, it's all out there. You just have to be able to find it. And it's so hard because then I'm like, okay, is this going to work at school? That's always what I think of. If I find something awesome at home, I teach The Crucible, which is Arthur Miller's story of like the Red Scare in America, but also like told through, you know, the Salem Witch Trials. And so there was this really cool website. I don't even know if it's still up anymore. I tried, I've tried to use it a few times. It was basically a website that took you through whether or not you answered all these questions and it was interactive. And then at the end, it was like, you're a witch or you're not. And it was based on like how ridiculous the claims were. And we had so much fun doing it at where I student taught because we had a one-to-one iPad there. When I got my job at my current school, I started teaching the crucible, couldn't wait to do it. I wanted to see how many witches we had, like the whole thing wouldn't work. Ever since that, that was my first year of teaching. I've learned a really valuable lesson, which is like, if you can't find it on the school internet at school, don't bring it from home because it's probably right. not going to work. Yeah, that's really But like, there are cool opportunities that exist out there that like, I'm limited on and that million, I'm sure tons of teachers are limited on. Right. Because of these goofy things. And I know they're trying to protect kids, but like... Well, I guess I could say there might be technical reasons for why bandwidth restrictions and sure. such for, that might prevent some of these sites from learning. So it's not necessarily that some curmudgeonly a person is sitting in an office blacklisting <laughs> educational no. resources, but no. but if it's the case, then I think the school should absolutely be investing in broader bandwidth for students, yeah. many of whom don't, you know, have internet at home. Mm-hmm. This is and gonna, that's just it. You're exactly is, right. This is going to be the one place in their developing lives that they have an opportunity to connect to the internet and to learn from the internet. And when, and when a school's internet plan or you know network administrator is so limited, whichever the case may be, that we can't figure out ways to make educational resources available to them, I think that's a huge failing. Mm-hmm. It's a huge failing, mm-hmm. and I'm willing to go on a crusade to kind of fix Please do. fix that um and especially in schools around here where it's no guarantee like i said it's no guarantee that a student's mm-hmm. family is going to have access to broadband mm-hmm. or even you know there's a lot mm-hmm. of dial up and satellite internet around here but yeah. some people don't and even have that have computers of their own they right. have a cell phone that they type on or whatever and that's you know, their that one it... way to get mm-hmm. to the internet and if you are in a place where you find a lot of students that you may have don't have access to internet at home. Guide them in the direction of your local public library because a lot of mm-hmm. them tend to loan out as a functional library for free internet cards that you can use to connect to the web. Mm-hmm. It's a big opportunity there that not enough people know about, but if you have the chance to check your local library and see if that's a resource that they for provide. Sure. Or so. just, hey, just go to your local library and, like, do some stuff. Check it out. We are very pro-library. Like, just go, go hang out. to your local library. Like, do their free stuff. They're great. There's a lot of opportunities in local libraries. I think we should do a whole show on that at some point. But So I don't know what we've come to. I think that maybe the important part is that we know that there is a place for it. It's how to manage it. But it's also difficult to teach t- teenagers, you know, in my case, what expected use looks like. And I don't, like, cyberbullying, we can do that in an episode. It's just so consuming. Like, I don't know how to stop it. And that's what is so frustrating. And as long as that's a, as prevalent of an issue. Yeah, I don't know that it can be. be stopped. I yeah. think the only way to deal with it is to educate about it. Mm-hmm. And that is going to involve having access, allowing people to have access to something. There is great risk in educating people to mm-hmm. manage themselves about stuff like that. Yeah. But... I think a full-on ban does nothing but promote well, and as bad long behavior. As, I mean, as long as the rhetoric and the political climate is what it is, cyberbullying is going to be happening. Mm-hmm. And there's, we just have to find a way to be bigger than it. And we just it. have to be best. Be best. <laughs> Please be best this time, okay? <laughs> but that's what I, I'm so serious. Like, I hate to be that joking about it because it's really not funny, like, at all. But 
as long as leaders in all kinds of politics can speak the way that they do about others, it's going to keep happening. Absolutely. I think you're right that students will reflect what is modeled to them. So if you're in a position of authority, watch out because there might be a young, impressionable mind yeah. paying attention to what you do. And like teachers, like I, you have to remind yourself of that all the time. When I get worked up about stuff, when I've got strong feelings about stuff, you know, I've got to, I've got to keep myself in check. Mm-hmm. And I'd like to let it fly, trust me, but it's not always better. Wouldn't we all? <laughs> but no, I mean, I guess, I don't know what I came to on this episode. I think I just, I'm frustrated that I feel like I can't do more about it. But I, I think it's important to teach teens times and places and appropriateness. And I think this is a way to teach it that's maybe productive and good for them. Um, I would hope that it's being modeled at home as well. My parents, still to this day, I'm going to be 30. And if I'm on my phone at the dinner table, my mom tells me about it. And I pay for my phone and I pay for my phone plan. But Joy's like, Caitlin. Okay. Click. You get full named. Yeah. It's like, oh, geez. But like, even, you know, at my age, like, I'm really, I'm aware of that because it's a respect. You know, my parents deserve my respect. Whatever. I'm an only child. I can't hide, you know, so, and the dog was never on his, so I guess it's got to be me. <laughs> There's no hiding as an only child. <laughs> I had my sister to blame everything on. Yeah, that worked out for you, but not for me. I sure did. Okay. Sorry, Claire. Anything else that you feel? No. Where are you on this now? Have you shifted? I haven't shifted. I Happy. still see pros and cons. Um, I think we should introduce students to the concept of self-regulation when it comes yeah. to all kinds of technologies. I think blanket bans are destructive mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons, but I also sympathize with the harsh realities of having connected students. Yeah. Um, so it's okay. not an easy one solution fits all kind no. of thing. Um, but I, again, do strongly believe in, in the strength of digital literacy and strongly believe that we should be equipping students to go forth into the world and do the best jobs that they can doing whatever it is they choose to do. And it's really hard to do that without the internet right now. So it's a cell phone, it's a computer, whatever it takes. I think it's worth some of the risks, not all of them, but it's worth some of the yeah. risks to allow students to be mm -hmm. connected. I, I agree. I think I don't know. I just, it's going to be hard. You know, it's, it's going to be a battle. It's never really going to, to change. I don't think, um, schools being held accountable for these things are going to make it difficult for them to give up the freedom to the students, to let them be on them. Students, teenagers are going to continue to be the, you know, <laughs> these beings that their brains are at war with themselves. And so they're not going to be able to make good, smart choices for themselves. And that's going to reflect in their online usage as well. So I think as long as... You know, it's just a it's just a big growing pain, honestly. And I think it's something that everyone has to go through. Yep. Are when, we ready to move on to what we learned this yeah, week? Yeah, I want to know what you learned because I can't wait to talk about mine. Okay. I learned about this thing called RetroPie. RetroPie is a thing that you install on a raspberry pi which is a small <laughs> computer i got this really cool kit that is a raspberry pi that's in a little case that looks like a tiny nintendo console but it's about the size of a deck of playing cards and it comes with a couple of usb controllers and you plug in the controllers you flash the retro pi system onto a little sd card that comes with it and then suddenly you've got this system that allows you to emulate all kinds of retro gaming consoles. So, you know, Commodore... It's basically endless. Right. Commodore it's... systems, Atari systems, uh, Super Nintendo, N N64, all of these kinds of old school NBA video game Jam. systems. What was that? NBA Jam. We can play NBA Jam. We can play all kinds of weird early 90s games we're enjoying flashing back to but it's a really cool application for the raspberry pi it's fun because the the internet archive actually has libraries of these roms for these old games and you can go and look on the internet archive mm -hmm. and download them and put them onto your retro pi uh well and like computer. the original thing looks like super nintendo controllers but you bought what were they 64s i bought n64 controllers yeah. for it we have super nintendo controllers for it 
and it's just a lot of fun. It's really nerdy. It's I've been wanting to do this for really a couple of years, but this is I finally got the kit and I learned how to set it up and how to install things and it's a lot of fun and a not very expensive way to kind yeah. of have a whole console system available to you. All kinds of different consoles actually yeah. emulated in this tiny little computer package. Well, we had the problem because I actually still have my Super Nintendo. Uh huh. And we went through a hassle trying to get it to work. Remember, it, it's very it's very finicky in its age. Right. It's like twenty five years old at this right. point. Um, and we could get a few games to work, and we bought a few more. But it, it, we couldn't hook it up to every like TV. It was we were really limited. Right. So this is really cool now because I I can care less about the state of the original Super Nintendo. Right, and just keep it because it's cool. You don't have to worry about keeping old hardware in functioning order. It's a new computer that's right. really relatively inexpensive, tiny little computer. Yeah. Um, their Raspberry Pi is really popular in educational settings too because it's a cheap computer that students can learn to do all kinds of programming things on and you can buy them in bulk for lots of applications and ways that yeah. you, you know you can fund a computer literacy course or a computer programming course in ways that you wouldn't otherwise be able to because these computers are just tiny little fun things that you it's can a smart little fella yeah they're smart but you can also beat them up without worrying too much so you can accidentally destroy the operating system and you have you aren't out you know a couple of thousand dollars for mm-hmm. the cost of a computer or mm-hmm. whatever so it's a lot of fun highly recommend what did you learn this week <laughs> what <laughs> i hmm. i learned a lot i think so the oscars now um you know th- th- we have the winners and all that stuff and the winner for best picture this year was called parasite which was a korean film the director is Bong Joon Ho, and it's, I mean, he's done other pieces, like movies prior to this, but this one won the Oscar. He actually won more than just the Oscar for this. Like, he won multiple this past year, but it's for this movie. And so um, it's Korean, so you'd like, you'd have to read it with subtitles. And I was a little bit worried about seeing that in theaters. I've never seen a movie in theaters with subtitles, and I historically have a pretty bad history of being able to pay attention, like, in a, in a run through of a movie without being distracted. So I was a little bit worried about paying for that. So I found it at, I don't remember, Walmart, somewhere like that. We bought the DVD. We watched it. So we know that the Academy has like a ton of problems and it's like we're representation of all kinds of people. But I, as I was reading about the winners, I was like, wow, okay, the Academy found something maybe here because it's different. Um, so we watched it and I don't know what I feel. I, I don't actually know. It was not what I expected. Right. What's it about? Give it a little bit of gloss um, without going too I deep into it. I don't want to go too far into it because you can kind of give it away kind of quickly. It's essentially about a family in Korea who is struggling uh, to be employed and to survive. Mm-hmm. And the their son is able to get a job working as a tutor for a very upper class family. Things kind of go from there, I guess is what I'll say. And so it becomes a family affair, essentially. And so tons of, I mean, I don't want to give too much, but I was excited to see the Academy choose something different. I was just excited to see it because I've heard a lot about it. We watched it and I just, we just kept looking at each other like, what is happening? So I guess here's what I would say. Watch it. Give it a chance. It's very different. You're going to have to commit some time to it to kind of stop and go to the kitchen and grab snacks or whatever because you can't just keep listening unless you speak Korean, which is great for you. Um... But think about it in a couple of ways, because it's one of those movies that when it ended, I just kind of was like, what was that? And then a few days later, I was like, what was that? And then today I'm still like, what is that? And so Rotten Tomatoes gave it a 99%, um, which is a big compliment for them. It has incredible ratings, actually. But don't go into it with, don't go look up anything. Don't get on Twitter. Just go, just go watch it. See what happens. It can be applied in all kinds of educational lights. It can be applied in all kinds of ways that we think about how we treat each other and ourselves and humans. And it's not a story of Korea. It's a story of everywhere. And so as I was like watching it, I've just been sort of like considering the students that could represent these families and like what that could be like in, you know, America and Southeastern Ohio. So I think it's a good movie. I loved it, but it's difficult. Can you Mm -hmm. add anything? Yeah. Are you with me? (laughs) I am. I'm still thinking about it days later for sure. sure. And I... For a lot of reasons, it's difficult to form strong, clear opinions about the film because there are a lot of surprising twists and turns Mm -hmm. on top of the fact that it's a Korean film, which is a little bit unfamiliar for us. It's beautiful. It is beautifully composed. Absolutely. There's a a lot to think about in it, Mm -hmm. but there's a lot I didn't understand. There's a lot more I want to understand. I've been doing Mm -hmm. a lot of reading about it, so... 
It was a good experience. It makes you think. Yeah. I mean, I like movies that do that. I I mean, we definitely went into it not knowing a lot. So that's good. Yeah, I knew nothing except that it won the best picture. Right. And that was kind of the only thing that really turned me on to it. Just because I was excited, like I said, for the Academy to to have some representation. So cool. Yeah. All right. Are we This was to- a good one. Yeah. <laughs> Are we ready to say goodbye for this week? So thanks for sticking around. Uh, mm-hmm. Go ahead, like, subscribe, review, tell your friends about us. We love to see uh, new people latching out of the podcast. We love to hear from you. You can find us on the web at 16to1.com, all spelled out. And on all your favorite podcatchers, we're working on submitting them to more, submitting our episodes to more places. So keep an eye out and let us know if you have a favorite podcasting app that you would like us to submit to. We can do that. Find us on Twitter at 16to1podcast and uh, on Instagram also at 16 to 1 podcast we'll see you next episode bye it looks like he's just carrying a block of ice it's got a penguin trapped inside of it